Welcome to the Binge Breakers Podcast. I'm Jacqueline. I am here to teach you how I overcame bulimia and my binge eating disorder and how you can too. Through simple steps of mind management, repairing your relationship with yourself, understanding your habits, and intuitive eating. All right. Hi, guys. We are here with Kelsey Johnson, and she is actually has a Master of Public Health from the University of Pennsylvania, and she was a clinical researcher, coor- research coordinator for the Center of Weight and Eating Disorders, but now she is a contact tracing coordinator for the city of Philadelphia. So I'm really excited to bring her on. She has her own story when it comes to eating disorders. She um, is a bodybuilder and uh, loves lifting weights, girl to my own heart, and I just, I'm excited to see what she has to say. So hi, Kelsey. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, My name is Kelsey. Um, Thank you so much for bringing me on the show. Um, It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Like Jacqueline said, I am a recent MPH grad, so I just graduated with my master's in public health. Um, I just started working for the city of Philadelphia, and I'm working on their COVID containment um, as a contact tracing coordinator. And um, yeah, so I've been bodybuilding for, I would say the past four, four to five years. And I originally started in CrossFit. Um, I have an extensive background in history in eating disorders and um, disordered eating habits. And, you know, I've gotten through those things over time. And I'm just so happy to be here and talk to you about these things today. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Well, I think what I usually do with guests and I really dive into it is just tell us your story about your eating disorder. I know you look on uh, Kelsey's Instagram, you can find before and after pictures and her kind of sharing glimpses into what it was like, but tell us Kelsey kind of what what it was like for you, what's your story? Sure, sure. So I've always, um, I suffer from a very strong OCD background. Both my parents have OCD and I kind of just, you know, born into it. I had OCD tendencies when I was like very young um, that my mom quickly realized. Um, And, you know, typically just because of the type of person I am, I'm very type A, I want you know, I'm a perfectionist when it comes to a lot of things that I get involved in, whether it be school or, um, you know, whatnot. So when I started my fitness journey, I thought, you know, I had just broken up with a long-term boyfriend. I I remember I was, I think, end of my junior year of, like, undergrad. I had just finished a relationship with um, someone for, like, eight years, that I was with for eight Mm -hmm. years. And I was like, all right, well, I want, I want to start working out. I want to get like strong and like, you know, do all these things. Um, so I decided I wanted to just start doing CrossFit. That was like my, um, beginning of my journey, I guess you could say. And, um, from that, I kind of got more and more into CrossFit, but at the same time, it was just like, um, you know, I would say I, I also kind of started getting addicted to the cardio aspect because CrossFit is very cardio intensive. Um, but then also I just loved, I liked running when I was in college. I hate running now, but I liked running then. <laughs> and so I got like super into running and, um, you know, was super into CrossFit and like, you know, all these things started watching what I was eating. And, you know, it just one thing after another, it was just like a stone was being placed and I was just kind of going down this hole of like, you know, disordered eating, yeah. <laughs> eating disorders. And like, you know, it, it really was, I truly, I truly believe it. Like a, a lot of it had to do with just, you know, the type of person that I was and, you know, be cu- coming from an OCD background, it's, it's very easy to get into like these this mindset of like oh this is normal this is what I'm supposed to be doing this feels good and right but then you know from someone looking from the outside in it looks like okay what she's doing is kind of irrational some of these things like you know are a little overkill like but for me in that time I just it didn't feel that way at all so yeah it's hard um, to see it when you're in it absolutely it's so hard to see it when you're in it and then you know, it, it really didn't occur to me that it was like an issue until um, I remember one of my one of my CrossFit trainers, she like asked me if I was like, okay, she was like, are you okay? Like, you're looking like really small, like skinny, like, are you doing okay? And I was like, yeah, like, 
I feel fine, still kind of didn't really feel like I had an issue and kind of just pushed it off, I feel like, in that time. I just maybe wasn't ready to, you know, accept it or deal with it. Um, and I think part of me also feared because I had, you know, at that point lost a lot of weight. I was just afraid of what would happen when I started to eat more and when I stopped exercising, I, you know, it was that fear of like, okay, well, now I've lost all this weight, you know, I'm worried about what's going to happen when I start eating normally again. So yeah, people think that so. they're just going to continue gaining weight forever and it's just exactly. going to, they're just going to die or something. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's almost like a weird superstition in a way now that I look back. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. But anyway, continue. Yeah, it, Sorry. it is. And um, I think, you know, the thing that made me kind of realize for me, like, I guess my, like the point where I was like, okay, maybe there's something going on. Like I have an issue was when I started, um, cause I never used to, I never binge ate in my life, but once I started to, I guess, restrict myself and, you know, obviously I was exercising a lot, doing a lot of cardio, not really doing a lot of like heavy lifting. It was more just like cardio focused at the time. Um, yeah, I, I, lost a lot of weight during that time and you know it just you know you don't realize it again because you're living in it it's just it's crazy but you know for me the red the biggest red flag was when I started like binge eating and I realized and it would it wouldn't ha I didn't do it a lot but like one maybe like once a week or something I would just be like okay I'm way too hungry and I would just eat like everything in the house and then you know you obviously have those feelings afterward where you're like you, you're like, what just happened? <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and you're like, you're like, okay, like, I feel terrible about myself. Like, it, like, I remember those, po the post, like, binge eating, like, feelings are, like, the worst feelings in the world. Mm -hmm. I remember feeling, like, like, awful about myself and feeling like there was nothing that I could do at that point. And it was just, like, I felt truly stuck at that time. And, I think, um, you know, what was really, I mean, I think the biggest thing was eating, eating more definitely helps that, but, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much like, I guess the, the start of my story and, um, you know, like, I guess that's the worst that it got was when I like started binge eating and, you know, I just, I did not feel like myself. I had no energy and, you know, it was just, it was a rough time. Well, was it um, binge eating the ball by restriction and then binge eating the ball by restriction, that kind of circle? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I was very, you know, into like my fitness pal, you know, during this time. And, you know, I would track what I ate and, um, you know, I would not allow myself to eat a whole lot. I think I would cap it at like 1500 calories, which is like an absurdly low amount for the amount of activity that I was already already doing mm -hmm. um, with CrossFit and like everything else and just being a student. Um, yeah, I did not, um, you know, I, I did not treat my prodi properly during that time. And it's, and it was really, it was sad. And I think once I, once I got to grad school. So I graduated from Ryder, and then I came to Penn. Um, I started, I was, I wasn't going through the binge eating as much because I was actually starting to allow myself to eat more at that point once I started at Penn. Um, but I started feeling like really, really sick at that time when I was at Penn, like my first year, like I had like no energy whatsoever, like I'd go up a flight of stairs and I'd be like winded. Oh, wow. um, I lost like my period for like over two years. Um, and yeah, it was just like, I, I was feeling really weird. Like I did not feel like myself. So I ended up going to a bunch of doctors <laughs> when I was at Penn. Um, and actually I, I, at that time, I also sought out therapy because I, I did, was kind of coming to like the terms of like 
just wanting to, I just wanted all the help. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like, give me all the help that I can just have right now. I will take the therapist. I will take the psychiatrist, the nutritionist, like give it all to me. Because like at that point, I just felt like I had hit like the rock bottom. Um, you know, it was, I was feeling very weak. You know, I was relying too much on my fitness pal. Um, I had an awful relationship with food. And so I was just like, all right, this is enough is enough. You know, I got to, got to make some changes here. So the how, nutritionist, <laughs> how long oh, go did ahead. it take you to get from like the start of the binge eating and all those behaviors to be like, okay, I need help. Like how long right. do you think that took you? So I probably started like the binge eating and, you know, the very low calories, um, probably I would say like the end of my junior year of college so like that summer um and then I and then I started seeking like treatment and help I would say like the end of like my senior year of college so may, probably like a full year okay. or like or like nine months of like me trying to like figure it out and then like um eventually I came around and I was just like no this I need the help um so you know when I when I got to Penn, I, you know, we, they have great, um, help here in Philly, like the, um, they have cognitive behavioral therapy centers and things that you can go to. So I, I started doing, um, CBT for my, um, for my OCD and I, you know, it also, and, and they kind of coincide for me, like my eating disorder and my OCD definitely coincide. Um, and I'll, and I think my, eating disorder was definitely made worse because of my OCD. Mm -hmm. um, so the cognitive behavioral therapy was like extremely helpful for me. Um, going to a nutritionist was also very helpful. Um, and then, you know, through going to all of them, actually, they found out that I had a, um, I had a blood disorder called hereditary hemochromatosis, oh. which is, yeah. <laughs> so that was why I wasn't feeling well, <laughs> but they figured this out because um, basically H, it's called HH for short. It's, um, it impacts a lot of like um, Irish descendants. So my great grandmother had it. And basically what it is, is it's like, um, it's where the iron, where iron builds up in your body. So you will have like iron overload essentially. Mm -hmm. And it gives you very similar um, effects to like anemia. So a lot of the symptoms are very similar, like feeling weak, um, but you know, lethargic and all that kind of stuff um, is exactly how I felt. Um, and I thought at the time, you know, it was because I wasn't eating a lot of food, which it probably was also because of that. But in addition to not eating a lot of food, I was also struggling from this disease that I had no idea about. And, you know, when they did an MRI of my, you know, organs, they found that they were like 98% saturated with iron. Wow. So, <laughs> so I had, so I've, I've been getting, um, so <laughs> since then, I started getting therapeutic phlebotomies. So it's kind of, it's almost like bloodletting essentially but it works because it you know you get rid of the iron um and the reason why this actually started for me so young was because i had lost my period you know normally for females the females don't usually realize they have hereditary hemochromatosis until they're like older until they're like you know in menopause so because i didn't have like that you know the, that period i think that I got it much sooner than I, or I realized it much sooner than I would have if I, you know, had been eating normally and like doing, you know, everything that I was supposed to be doing. Right. Um, so, so yeah, it's just very, it's very interesting how that also emerged from um, me being sick at that time. So, yeah, and that's well, something that I'll have to do for the rest of my life also. It's just, you know, the, the bloodletting is part of what I do now. 
so how do you um there are a lot of things i want to dive back into with that like i really want to talk mm -hmm. to you about uh yeah. cdt a bit more but how do you kind of just accept that as part of your life like have you, have you forgiven yourself for that and just kind of be like this is how it is like how do you deal with that yeah um well for me like once i started doing the the treatments the therapeutic phlebotomies like i started feeling a lot better right away um so that was like a huge motivator for me to just keep doing it was because i was like i would get them and then i would feel like instantly less tired it was very strange like wow. so i i would have like way more energy and i would be like i'd go to the gym the next day and i'd be like flying around the, <laughs> the weight room <laughs> I was like, this is great. I have so much energy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think that that in itself is a huge motivator just because I like felt so good after I, I got them done. Um, yeah, I, I would say that's probably like the biggest motivator. And I would say, yeah, I have for forgiven myself for it just because, you know, it's, it's part of my journey. Like, I, even though it was like, a, a darker time or a sadder time in my journey. It's still an important part of my journey. And, um, you know, I still wouldn't trade that part of my journey. I think that it was important for me to go through those struggles and everything in order for me to kind of end up in a better spot, you know, yeah. and, and kind of go through those things and figure, figure things out on my own and just, you know, find that good balance between you know, food and exercise and just living life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we all want to think that our journey is going to be linear and completely just a one shot, but I wouldn't take back any of my eating disorder either because it's allowing me to do what I want to do now. And, and there's no exactly. sense arguing with the past, but I know a lot of people hold shame and guilt and, you know, a little bit of bitterness towards wasting time, but there's, yeah. you just can't do that. So thank you for sharing yeah. that. Of course, of course. Um, so cognitive behavioral therapy, I am a big supporter of that. How did that help you? Can you share a little insight of what that was like for you? Sure, yeah. So it was really helpful for me um, just because um, if you're anything like me and have some sort of like OCD or type, even just a type A personality where you strive for that, you know, perfectionism or um, CBT is a great way to kind of combat that and um, shine light on, you know, what, if something's rational or not, you know, so they, they're pretty good at, you know, they'll give you like homework every time you go, which I kind of liked. Um, so basically, whatever you are afraid of, <laughs> <laughs> or <laughs> if you have a fear food or, you know, um, if something scares you in relation to food, cognitive behavioral therapy will kind of um, not, yeah, kind of force you in a sense to get out of your comfort zone and to challenge yourself and try those things that, you know, that you're afraid of doing. Um, so for me, you know, I was very into using my fitness pal and I, I had used I literally used that app for like on and off for eight years, wow. eight years. Yeah. So from high, from like prom at high school to like postgraduate, like in college, like I was still using it. It's a <laughs> like, long time. Yeah. <laughs> it's a long time. So, you know, I, I went to my first CBT session and they were like, yeah, this is kind of like, we can see that this is like a main issue for you. So we <laughs> want you to get rid of this. <laughs> so I was like, you know, at the time it was like, it felt like the worst possible thing I could do. If I was terrified of do of getting rid of my fitness pal, I, you know, I was like, I'm going to spiral out of control. I had all these like irrational thoughts around like deleting my fitness pal. Um, and then, you know, I realized you know, the first homework assignment they gave me was to get rid of my fitness pal. So it's like you carry so, around this like <laughs> thing, the thing you know you shouldn't have, but you're like, oh, there's other problems. I like, don't get rid of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're like, this one's not as bad as the other one. Yeah, <laughs> they're no. like, I want that um, one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so they, they, that was the first thing that they 
you know, told me to get rid of. And honestly, I got rid of it. And it was like, I just remember that I remember getting rid of it. I remember that whole day, like literally <laughs> getting rid of it and just like feeling so free. And like, finally, I'm like, wow, I can, I can eat whatever I want. And there's not like a little computer telling me like what I can and can't eat. Like, this is great. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I, I just remember feeling like so freaking relieved when I got rid of that app. And um, I think a lot of the like homework assignments that um, CBT goes through and the, you know, that therapist will give you um, are the things that you're not going to want to do. <laughs> yep. And they're going to be the things that you're afraid to do. But it, they also get, they're also really good at tackling like the main issue. I only needed to go to CBT for about six months. Wow. So okay. yeah, yeah, because they immediately tack, like they don't play around. <laughs> they tackle the issue like head on. Um, and so I think that that sort of approach instead of kind of like dancing around being like you know I, I don't have anything against traditional th talk therapy but I do think that CBT is really good in that they just get straight to like the point and mm -hmm. they tackle the main point right away which is like really good for people I feel like who are struggling from eating disorders and stuff yeah um, to get to get right on that yeah I definitely agree that exposing yourself to what you fear most is the best way to get past it because the other option is to avoid it for the rest of your life and that's just not really a way yeah. to live in my opinion no. but no, um absolutely not yeah no and I like that you said it forced me to be uncomfortable because that's why I say a lot in my podcast is like mm -hmm. you need to be willing to be uncomfortable and in my program that I made like it's like okay that's one of the first modules it's like if you're not willing to be uncomfortable if you're not willing to kind of push yourself then this isn't gonna work but right just, just because but once you face that fear then once you went through that discomfort you're like this isn't even that bad right <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. that's awesome yeah yeah it was like that's exactly how I felt it was it was like I had all these fears and um you know I thought that something so bad was going to happen when I deleted my fitness pal and when I started eating you know normal foods and then you know you know, it's scary for the first couple of days, but then you realize like, oh, nothing's happening to me. And I feel better because I'm not like tied down um, to this app, you mm -hmm. know, or like to the watch or what, the, whatever the numbers and all that kind of stuff. So it probably <laughs> none of that. up a bunch of your time too. Like, uh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I, f I felt like all of my mental, all my mental energy even though I was, I was in grad school at this time, like all of my mental energy was on food, mm -hmm. on what I was going to be eating next, on I, if I had, a, you know, a, a, you know, all the necessary ingredients that I needed, like I worried about all of these things. Um, and, you know, I really didn't need to be worrying about them that right. much, you know, it, it was just like, it took up so much of my mental space that I just felt like I had no no time for anything else that was like enjoyable like i i did feel like when i like you know i missed out on you know certain things that you know that I, that I wish i could have attended and you know certain gatherings with friends that i wish i could have went to um you know all of those things happened to me as well um but i think i was just so mentally fixated on the numbers and, you know, hitting my macros perfectly that, you know, none of those other things really mattered as much to me at that time. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. It, it's crazy when you live your life with an eating disorder and the things that you do skip out on because of it and you think it's justified during the time, but then looking back, it's like, what was I doing? But then also, you know, once right. you get rid of it, you become like a super being because you're like, I have all this energy, like you're saying, and then also the <laughs> yeah. capacity, the, the work that you can do, the concentration. So, yeah. Well, can you tell me a bit about, like, clearly you still have busy goals and, mm -hmm. and you still, like, you lift weights every day, well, not every day, probably, but you know what I mean. Um, how do you go about that? Because as we know in the fitness industry, 
eating disorders are rampant. A lot of people, a lot of influencers have tons of eating disorders and they just don't say anything. Mm-hmm. So my how time. have you kind of kept fitness in your life with a healthy mm-hmm. approach? Right. Right. So for me, it definitely, um, once I, I started, I guess I started my, I guess I can start this with my like first reverse diet. (laughs) And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting, but I went from a very small state and I was very tiny. Um, and when I decided I wanted to, you know, gain weight and I wanted to let go of all these, um, tools of dieting that were kind of holding me down, um, I didn't want to get rid of like my physique goals. I still wanted to get strong. I still, um, you know, I wanted to feel my body properly and just feel good overall, um, which I wasn't before. Mm-hmm. Um, so I started weightlifting um, after I after I after CrossFit. I did that for like two years. Came to Penn. CrossFit is way too expensive in Philadelphia. So I was like, <laughs> I was like, all right, I'm going to do this on my own. So I started just kind of um, weightlifting on my own. Um, I, I actually sought out the help of a um, coach for the first time, like a, like a um, macro, not, he doesn't help me with my macros anymore, but he helps me like nutritionally, um, just make sure I'm eating enough food. Um, and I think that you know, seeking out like a coach um, did help me when I was like starting to transition from being like very cardio focused, very, um, you know, not eating a lot to more like strength training, um, muscle building and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, so that way I just to make sure that I had the um, the tools in my shed, um, should you say. I hired a coach to kind of help me with this process just because I, I was, I was definitely nervous, like going into it, you know, um, just because I knew I was going to be eating more food than I was used to. Um, and also probably working out less, which, um, which was also scary to me. Um, but then once I started, you know, I, 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 um, I met with Bob, my, my coach's name is Bob, um, once in person, and I was, you know, I told him all of my background, my fears, and he's like, all right, yeah, I understand, like, this is what you, where you're coming from, and this is your background, um, we're going to focus on, you know, getting your health, you know, back first and foremost, you know, I, at that point, I still did not have my period, um, and my blood work was still, like, not as great as it could be, um, cause I was still like just getting over the hereditary hemochromatosis things. So, um, my like liver function was like a little off from that time. And, um, you know, it's amazing what happened. Like I started working with him and I probably, I immediately started eating probably double what I was eating. <laughs> like I went from like, you know, probably like, 1500 2000 calories to like almost you know f- over 3000 calories a day wow. and i and for me that was like terrifying right <laughs> mm-hmm. but then you know i felt so much better in the gym like i was able to lift more weights and i felt myself getting stronger and honestly that was like very very motivating to me and just like it just made me want to continue on this journey and it made me want to um continue to gain actually continue to like gain weight in a sense like I was like okay I actually want to continue to put on muscle and just like have this be you know a it's it's a work in progress always but um you know it made me want to continue down that path of strength strength training and just focusing on getting stronger and not like skinnier yeah. <laughs> anymore. Well, it's like yeah. a build momentum for you, right? Like you ate Absolutely. some more food and all of a sudden things started getting a lot better. Like you have more energy. Absolutely. Yeah. And Absolutely. I don't think uh, no one has to physique build or, you know, try to gain a bunch of muscle, but 
I really yeah. love like watching, I think from the point of your story, it's kind of like striving to get healthier and stronger. It's really cool to see what your body can do versus trying to make it yeah. the smallest possible version. It's just like, it's very Absolutely. empowering, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I came from that, you know, that idea and that background of, you know, I wanted to be like the smallest person in the room. Like that was, you know, my goal and my goal was always to be under a certain, you know, weight on the scale and, you know, all these things. I put all these pressures and constraints on myself. Um, but really, I just needed to let myself grow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just needed to like give myself undenying permission to, to grow. Um, and, you know, even if that means, you know, gaining, gaining some weight, like that's okay. Like that's, that could be part of my growth. That could be part of everyone's growth. Um, you know, it's, I, I do feel like our bodies are a lot smarter than we give them credit for. And I think that, you know, I think that our bodies can handle a lot more food than we give them credit for too. Yeah. Do. Our bodies have a lot of adaption systems in place and like tons of things going on underneath the surface. It's crazy how they work. Mm -hmm. How did mm -hmm. you, um, I'd love to talk to you a bit about body dysmorphia and especially when you went from being very skinny to being a much uh, like bigger weight, like how did mm -hmm. you handle that? Were there any bad days in between? Yeah. Yeah, I would definitely say there were some bad days just because um, when you are eating like so much food, there's you're inevitably going to start gaining fat. And it's just like, I was always afraid of like gaining fat and I was eating a lot of fats also, like not just, um, I had always avoided fats in my diet just in general. And I feel like I'm not alone on that. I feel like a lot of people avoid fats in their diet. Um, yeah. And so when I started eating like a ton of fats, I was like, okay, well, I don't know how this is going to like affect my like physique or whatever. Um, but what I ended up finding was that my hair got better, my skin got better, <laughs> my, my nails got better, my period came back, um, my sex drive came back. <laughs> yeah. All the, like, I felt like a human being again and um so I was just like okay well if this is what fats can do <laughs> I'm not, I'm I'm all for the fats so yeah. so that was that was definitely something I experienced um but it, just in general I would say you know there became there came a point when I um once I got to like a, a certain weight I started just having a little more like happy weight my abs I you know I used to have like abs and like those went away like I don't have you know the ripped abs like I used to but it's it's fine like I'm I'm okay with it because like I know that if I wanted to ever like compete or whatever I could do that but right now that's not like my goal my goal is just to be like happy and you know live a good life and not have to worry about like you know not have to um, worry too much about like what I'm putting in my body or mm -hmm. if it's like the perfect amount or if, you know, um, so just having that ease of mind, I think um, helps me a lot and just not being as stressed. I feel so like mentally, much more mentally free than I ever have in my entire life. So that's amazing. Um, so yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's definitely like, like I would say like the physical, the physical gains were, were nice, but the mental gains were the best for sure. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, obviously it's nice to, um, you know, see your body change and things like that and have the sequels, but mm -hmm. I, I would agree. I think the mental is so much more important, right? Cause it just mm -hmm. changes your perspective and outlook, outlook on life. Um, and I like that you said, you literally said, it's fine. Like when you were <laughs> gaining weight and you didn't have abs anymore, it's like, it's fine. And a lot of people think, I, I try to ask, and when I ask people this, and when I was going through it and I gained weight, and I ended up losing weight after recovery a little bit, but mm -hmm. when, I, when I set out to recover and I was like, I need to just be all in on this, um, mm -hmm. and I started gaining weight, I was like, 
it is fine. Like, what's the worst that's going to happen? And is anyone going to die if I gain weight? Like, right, am right. I going to die? No. <laughs> like, and it's okay if you're not perfect. So I love that right. you said that. Yeah. And, and I always felt, I always worried about like what other people were going to think of me once I started gaining weight as well. But you know, what I, what I came to find was that people were so much more worried about me when I was like small that sure. once I started gaining weight that pe people were like so happy. Like all my friends and family were like, you look great. Like you're, you look healthy again. Like they just, they could tell, like, I was smiling more. I just seemed more happy. I seemed more like myself. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, um, all those concerns that I had, you know, I felt like none of them, none of them happened. It was all just kind of like, in my head, I was making it seem like all these bad things were going to happen once I started gaining weight. Um, but really, nothing, nothing terrible happened. <laughs> yeah, right? The world yeah. didn't crash down and yeah. people were still... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I'd love to ask you just a little bit about your clinical research coordinator job at mm -hmm. the Center for Weight and Eating Disorders. What was that like working with people? Sure. So I actually, um, so for that position, I worked with um, children who are autistic, actually. Okay. So, so, but they were all um, children who were very picky eaters. And like, um, you know, some of them only ate like three things. So like, it'd be like chicken nuggets, French fries, and French and French oh, no. fries. <laughs> so so yeah, these were children who, you know, had a lot of a um, lot of struggles when it came to getting in like just variety of foods. So um, I pilot tested an app with them that um, it was called uh, Nutrition Ninja. And it was this little cute app that, you know, the parent and the child got to download on their phone and it used um, reward systems to kind of incentivize the children to try different things, fruits and vegetables, um, if they, if they wanted to. <laughs> oh, that's so um, cool. Yeah. And it was, it was really fun. Um, it was in, it, it was part of a uh, CHOP study. So it was um, through CHOP for the, um, Children's Hospital, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So oh, neat. That must be fun. It must have been interesting for you going through your own kind of OCD behaviors to then see mm -hmm. that in, in children as well. And yeah. unifying situations yeah. that make sense for kids especially. Mm -hmm. But the Absolutely. funny thing is like we think that kids are so different from us, but like really like we even as adults we have we love having motivation motivation and rewards for things so absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah I definitely like I felt like that job was very good for me to have at the time that I had it just because um in a way I, de I definitely felt like I was able to relate to the kids um and just like um you know I understood like where they were coming from I know like a lot of them have different textural um, issues so they don't like certain textures which um, can be you know very challenging for like parents and you know it was I think just the COVID um, you know pandemic made it even more challenging for the parents so just to kind of be there as like a support for them and you know um, you know I was able to tie in my own past experiences with you know eating only certain foods and all that so it was very interesting to see the parallels between the two jobs or that job in my my life. <laughs> yeah. So you have um you have a personal attachment to you have a little bit more empathy. And not to say that people that haven't had any disorder don't have empathy, but um when mm -hmm. you've been through it, you can really easily see what's going on. So Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I don't want to keep you forever. So I'd love to ask one last question. And it's sure. if you were to offer advice to someone who's going through their own restrictive patterns, maybe have some OCD tendencies, what's mm -hmm. the first step you'd recommend for them to kind of let go of those and recover? Right. So the first thing that I would recommend is to get out of the comfort zone. Um, whatever that might be for you, um, take those initial steps and find something that makes you feel uncomfortable and do those things. <laughs> yeah, do the things that make you feel uncomfortable. It kind of, you know, of course, it'll make you, you know, uneasy now, 
but you know the more you do these things um it'll just become second nature and you'll feel so much better and so freer just because you're you know allowing yourself to do those things um the second thing that i would recommend is to not be afraid to ask for help or to seek help um, whether that be through CBT, through a dietitian, um, I started, you know, seeing a psychiatrist, and that also really helped me as well. Um, and even just like a coach, like if if it helps you to have some sort of like nutrition coach or someone who you can turn to for, you know, questions or support, um, I found that that was very very helpful to me. Also, yeah. um, and then. One more thing that I would also that I would also suggest, um, you know, find an activity that you like to do. Um, it does don't think that you have to be limited to, you know, physique building or bodybuilding or running. Like, there's so many ways to get exercise in. Like, you, you know, find something you love. Find the way that you love moving your body and do that thing. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah, definitely, definitely find that thing. <laughs> Yeah, I love that advice because it's people think they have to do only like cycling or something. It's like, no, you could walk your dog or you could walk around yeah. with a podcast, whatever you want to yeah. do. So yeah, that's absolutely. Awesome. And the nice thing, it's kind of funny, your, um, your first piece of advice and your second piece of advice kind of tie in with each other because like being uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but getting help force you to be uncomfortable too. So I think it's great. Absolutely. And I'm sure getting help is also uncomfortable for you to do. And the first part just reaching out is always hard so yes yes it is <laughs> yeah. thank you for that advice so of where course. can the audience find you right so definitely follow me on my instagram um which is underscore food underscore for thought underscore um i'm sure that you know you can share it as you know feel free to share it as well jacqueline mm -hmm. um and then you can also find me i'm also a um I lost your screen for a sec. I'm also a um, blog writer for um, Bon V Health and Nutrition Consulting. Um, this is actually the company that I did my final capstone presentation with for my um, master's in public health. I'm just pulling up the website. Um, so it's bonvhealth.com, B-O-N-V-I-E health.com. And then if you go to the blog, um, I pretty much have written all the blog posts on there. So, so yeah, definitely take a look at it. Um, there's, you know, some stuff for self-care. We wrote a whole blog series on like, you know, self-care during quarantine um, and, you know, how to ditch the dieting tools, how to, you know, intuitive eating, mindful eating is all discussed on there. So there's definitely some, some good things on there if you guys want to check it out. Yeah, that sounds like a fantastic resource. I'll, for all you guys listening, I'll link her Instagram below, but I'll also link the bobbyhealth.com blog down awesome. below so you guys can access it. And if you follow me on Instagram, then you'll definitely see it in my story at some point very soon. So. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, awesome. Right, well, thank you so much for having or being on the show, Kelsey. I really appreciate it. Yes. yes, and thank you so much for having me, Jacqueline. It was, um, it was such a pleasure to talk to you today and, you know, to share my story with you all. Yeah, yeah, of course. All right, bye, guys. I'm holding in a